Uh, so I'm Gianmarco Di Sario, I'm from Latitude. We are a small data boutique uh, consulting firm um, and we're hosting together with Increment. Uh, just for a quick show of hands, careful. Who's, uh, who's a data scientist versus engineer? Who's a data scientist? Okay, so there's some math E people in. Who's more on the engineering side? Okay, most of you. Who's just interested in data but isn't necessarily technical? <laughs> Couple. Cool. Um, okay, so I've got way too many slides. So I just want to go make sure that I'm assessing the re level right. And if it goes over your head, please let me know. Then we'll skip that part and we'll just go to the conclusion. Um, so we're going to be talking about causal inference. Uh, let me just quickly have one slide. Uh, some clients we work with. Food ticket is there. Represent. Nice. Um, so yeah, the, the talk is going to be about a lot of causal inference, but I don't know if anyone has heard of Bayesian statistics and stuff. I think most of you, right? Yeah, it's a big discussion, I think, about five years ago or so. It was like, oh, frequentist Bayesian uh, was a big thing. I, th I wanted to pull up Google Trends and then show how everything kind of was evolving, but I think it's clear to say that that fight has been a bit over and people are more talking about causal inference and it's way more kind of mainstream-ish. So what's the difference? Uh, Bayesian statistics is very much focused on getting um, uncertainties from your data. So instead of having a point estimate, which is like what you first learn with machine learning, it just you predict something and that's a point estimate. You start talking about distribution and start thinking about how data is uh, produced. Take that one level further, you can go to where it's causal inference. So instead of just finding correlations in your data, you kind of want to start learning um, why did something happen and what is the effect and how can you measure the effect? So the, the kind of the talk that kind of set me off in that way was from uh, booking.com. I think it was by data 2019 here in Amsterdam where they said, well, people are rating our hotels, let's say an 8.5 or nine. Um, but we send the survey out and we ask people to uh, answer the survey. But there's a lot of people that don't answer the survey. And if you think for yourself, when do you answer a survey? Quite often when you're either very happy or you're very annoyed. So what is the actual rating of the hotel if the people who didn't answer the survey would have answered the survey? So nowadays actually correct for that such that they get a representative kind of valuation of their hotels. So that, that's kind of what this field is about. And there's so many different techniques and it kind of makes you think in a different way about your data. Then of course, since we're a consulting firm, we have to show a graph from Gartner. Um, so Carlso AI is the... Somewhere in the, in the hype cycle, it's kind of slowly starting out, they say here. So we are not as far as generative AI, which is the peak of inflated expectations, which I think we might already be past that. But um, So we're on our way up with causal AI. Um, so what is it? This is this um, great kind of graph that a, a guy from uh, um, PyMC once showed. Is basically, um, we've got our ladder of causality, and that's a really... Uh, ah, let's first talk uh, quickly about, uh, here's the frequentist domain. So this is what we are, kind of classic data science. Um, and we quite often stay here. And we'll, I will just show this with packages in Python in a little bit so that you can feel where you're at and what you're familiar with. Um, but the thing is that as soon as you have your data, the causes of how the data came to be are not in the data itself. So this, this part of um, kind of machine learning is quite limited in that scope. So there's no consideration of causality or priors and everything I just talked about. So if you start looking at I don't think you guys can see it, but there's, there's these famous correlations that seem very non-logical. So the number of people who drowned by falling in a pool is perfectly correlated with the amount of films Nicolas Cage appears in. So and then it feels like normally we start looking at this and it feels like, oh, we can predict one from the other, but it doesn't imply causation. Um, there's another one, like there's this great website from Tyler Vigen, if I say uh, I pronounce correctly, where he just finds correlations that are completely don't make sense. So liquefied petroleum gas used in the Netherlands Antilles is perfectly correlated with the number of edits to the Wikipedia article for correlation. So that's kind of nice. Um, so we will kind of move away from correlations in a bit. So this is kind of the letter of causality as uh, by the famous book, Book of Why. It's kind of, if you want to start in causal inference, please start with the Book of Why. It, it explains it in kind of normal-ish language to what it is and how you can start thinking about causes instead of correlations. So first he says you're in association, then you start kind of moving up and eventually end the counterfactuals. So you start thinking about 
what would have happened if something would have changed. So would I still have had a headache if I hadn't taken the aspirin? That kind of, kind of things that are very natural to us, but it doesn't necessarily appear in the data. Then on the other side, when we start kind of measuring uncertainties, we get our Bayesian inference. So you put prior information in there. If you have domain knowledge, your business knowledge, let's say you know that sales in this region somewhere in France are generally about this distributed or we can expect about this much, then you can put a certain uncertainty bound on there. And that's quite nice if you um, know more kind of business info. And this is also a big debate, like should you make the data speak in and of itself, or okay, should you put in some extra business knowledge? So I, I'm a very big proponent of this, of course, when it's applicable. So let's quickly divide uh, some packages. I think everyone is familiar with scikit-learn, XGBoost. XGBoost kind of already starts moving up a little bit because there's some stuff in there that you can do. Then if we start moving a bit more towards uncertainty quantification, like PyTorch, just a classic deep learning frameworks have some variational inference where you can start modeling some uncertainties. Stats models, of course, econometrics, very classic. Um, you start moving up there, uh, move back one. Then we've got a whole bunch of uh, packages being developed really quickly uh, lately. So we've got Causal ML, which is by Uber, I think. Then we've got Uplift ML, which is by Booking.com that just got released. So it's, it's a rapidly kind of evolving field. And on the other hand, we've got our more Bayesian approaches where you really start playing with probability distributions. So we've got PyMC there, and NumPyro, and Orbit is also from uh, um, Uber, I think. And the latest ones is from the PyMC team, which are really kind of cool. Um, I find this, we'll see a little bit later on. is PyMC Marketing, Causal Py, that kind of start combining those two. Because if you can start estimating what would have happened, then there's still quite often an uncertainty there. But it's very, like these, these packages don't always model that uncertainty really well. So if we kind of put it into a different landscape to kind of explain it maybe a bit easier, um, Super Mario games, let's, uh, let's see how the difficulty is to, to deal with the different type of packages. Later Super Mario game, quite easy to play. It's, it's 3D, looks all fun uh, and fancy. If we move up, we move to flat land, like you start a lot of li linear regression. You think you know everything that you're doing, but somehow it always gets harder. Um, I don't know if you ever, ever played Super Mario Bros. It always is a bit harder than the 3D one. The other one, uncertainty quantification, if you think about Bayesian, you've got your hierarchical models, it's still quite complex and kind of 3D in that sense, but the game itself is quite a bit harder to uh, finish, which I found with Super Mario 64 quite a lot. <laughs> and then you've got the end game. I don't know if anyone has ever played Super Mario Bros, like the OG. Exactly, there's no tutorial. If you die, you have to start all the way over. It's kind of how I feel like we were approaching kind of this field. Um, I, yeah, the use cases is more of kind of a consulting slide, that, not really that interesting. So the reason that uh, what I want to focus on is the, the stuff I've put over there, the marketing mix, customer life and values, the dynamic pricing is what I put in the description of the talk. Um, it's always when there's a lot of kind of human interaction involved that, that it becomes very uncertain and you kind of need to know what choices would have happened when. Same thing with, so some examples, dynamic pricing, what would we have sold if we would have priced it differently? You want to keep the entire world the same, but you can't. Customer lifetime value models, the same thing. Marketing mix models, those two we will uh, dive into a little bit. Um, and then, yeah, these, these kind of human interactions come together a lot with kind of everything data related, right? So if you're in a, in a data department, someone must have come to you either from marketing analytics, pricing or product or customer analytics that just asks you, some question about um, what would have happened if, can we do this, what, what, and ideally they have quite often a perception of there should be kind of one thing to do that can measure all of this, right? Like there's, there's this one ring to rule them all so we can make one massive model and it should spit out how our prices are correlated with our marketing efforts and how our customers interact with everything. But yeah, it doesn't necessarily need that just we have one AI model that fixes this. So let's, dive down into kind of how can we model this and how can we really approach uh, a single part, at, uh, um, uh, kind of each part in and of itself. So we only have about 20, 30 minutes. I've already been talking for five minutes or so. So it's, um, let's start drawing an owl. I don't know if you guys know this meme, but I don't have the time to explain it completely. So the first step is let's start with two circles. That's what I'll try to explain today and then I'll leave the rest up to you. So draw the rest of the fucking owl. <laughs> so that's kind of how you can explain it right now, right? So if you really want to, um, walk away with this feeling like you know everything that won't happen, uh, it, it is going to be quite hard. So what I will start out with is 
There's this thing called uh, double D bias ML, which is quite a nice, easy introduction to the field. So let's uh, start with that, and then eventually we start going down um, kind of the, 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 the difficulty tree. Cool, let's take a little break. What we have is we've got some notation that uh, I'm gonna be introducing, but um, I'm now realizing that uh, I haven't introduced it yet, it's coming later. <laughs> So we've got X, which are our features. Our treatment is something that we normally are gonna use. So let's, let's think about um, if applying a fungicide to a plant will make it grow uh, better or kind of it will uh, prevent fungus uh, on the plant. So th there's a treatment that you can assess to a plant. So you can either treat it with fungicide or not. And based on that, you can uh, kind of learn specific models. So the T-learner, what it says is just learn, just learn a very, it's a bit too small, um, you just learn a model on everything that didn't get a treatment. So you just say, I have my entire feature, feature set. I learned it all on, only on the output that didn't get a treatment. I learned a different model that get a, did get a treatment. And then I just uh, kind of um, subtract the two outputs from each other and then I get my uh, estimate. This is basically the, the ba most basic model you can do. Then there we can start going, there's an even simpler one, it's called the S-learner. Uh, there's a double D-biased machine learning learner. It's also still very easy. If you see this code, uh, every data scientist will kind of uh, explain or kind of understand it pretty quickly. And there's a lot of packages that have been now available. But behind all of this, well, we, we learned causal inference, cool. Um, let's just keep going. There's one big fundamental problem with causal inference. So. It actually is quite straightforward. The only thing that it, it is made to make be a lot uh, very confusing. And I, I, like if we go to the next slides, it can become very confusing. I understand that. I try to keep it as simple as possible. But it basically always boils down to think about the data generation process. So how did the data come to be? And then what variables do you have to include or exclude from your data? And that is basically what it, what it is. It is quite hard to find which variables to actually implement or don't uh, you shouldn't implement. Um, and then there's something technical, don't worry too much about hidden confounders and start thinking about the fundamental uh, problem that's there. So let's carry on with this example. I'll quickly try to explain what's possible and then we'll just have the, the, uh, the outputs of how to apply this in a real life context. So in what way does fungicide affect the growth of a plant? So what does applying a fungicide to a plant help it grow or not grow? So the treatment is applying this fungicide. The question is not what is the predicted height of the plant. That's what we would normally do, right? So we just are kind of curious to predicting the height of a plant. So now we're really interested in the effect of the treatment. So let's say some small notation. T is the data that we've measured. Um, if T is zero, we did not apply the treatment, so we did not apply fungicide. If T is one, we did apply the treatment. So let's quickly make it easy. We have a plant that has some fungus, and we have a plant that has some spray on it, so that's the fungicide, just uh, to, to kind of keep it a bit easier. So we've got the data that's measured. Then we can start thinking about a thought experiment, and this is where it becomes interesting. Let's say for marketing, how would, it, uh, how would my users react to a specific type of marketing? Well, you can only measure the thing that you actually have measured for two different groups, but you are sometimes curious to what would have happened to that group if you would have done something differently. So in the thought experiment, we can put the Y. So that's the thought experiment, we can put it to the same level. If it's the same level, well, then we expect the same output, so we just move it up. And then the thought experiment is we introduce, we, we copy it again and then we change the Y. So then we start applying the fungicide that was there to the group that actually did not have fungicide. So you kind of start thinking, what would have happened to this group if we would have applied the fungicide? So that's at Y1 and T0. And the other way around is if we have the group of plants that had gotten fungicide, what if they wouldn't have gotten fungicide? So you, you see here that already it becomes a bit of a, a confusing kind of set of variables. But let's, it, it kind of, and the notation will become more and more complex. I will uh, start skipping through it a bit faster. So basically what we have, we have uh, a row of things that say we have the average height of plants that did not receive the treatment, we have the average height of plants that did receive the treatment, and then it becomes uh, a bit vague what would have happened to these ones that in case they would have gotten the treatment and the other way around. Same thing, think about it as a, a patient. Some patients in a, in a randomized controlled trial get the treatment, some, some don't, and then how would that differ? And that's kind of the average treatment effect. 
So that is, what is the difference between the people that actually did get the treatment and did not get the treatment? Sadly, we can't measure that for the whole group because we only have a small group. Um, and I won't go too deep into this, but the only thing we can measure is for the group that got the treatment, what happened to them for the group that got the treatment and the other way around. There's something that happens here that this is basically your correlation that you start measuring and that's the only thing we have. And I think that this part is, it's super uh, weird to do this. We add zero to it. We just add and subtract the exact same amount and then we can rewrite some stuff. So math magic, is everyone still interested in this or is it going a bit too fast right now? No, it's good. Okay. Everything's good? Cool. So we've got our association, right? So we've got the treated group with the output of being treated and the tre not treated group with the output of not being treated. Now we add some weird stuff here where we basically say this is the treated group if they would not have gotten treatment and we add that and subtract that. So we don't change the formula at all. So we have that formula. I just put it up here now. And we're gonna rewrite it. We're gonna put some stuff together, uh, do some little bit of math. So what we now start seeing is if we put this thing together, we basically see we have the treated group. So we've got this group. And we start saying, we start subtracting the effect of the thought experiment of having treatment and not having treatment. So how would that group, what would the treatment effect of that group have been? So that's something they call the ATT. So that's the effect of treating the group that was treated. Then we have another part, and this is where it becomes um, a, kind of the, the hard part of everything um, causal inference related. This is the bias. And what does this bias say? It says we subtract the group that was treated from the group that was not treated, but we start thinking about those both those groups, what would have happened to those groups if they did not get treatment. So this is what we measured. This is our kind of our thought experiment. We applied treatment to this group, but what would have happened to them if they didn't get treatment? Okay, nice. So we have that. The thing is that as soon as you have this bias term, this is basically this bias is saying how did um, the treated and the non-treated group differ before they got the treatment. So if we say this in, in, in marketing language, how did were customers in France already different from the customers in Italy before they both got the treatment or not got the, not get the treatment? So how were those uh, groups already different? So that is that bias term. And if we can make this go to zero, then we end up with um, uh, causation in terms of what we're measuring. So everything we've measured is now a causal impact of what's happening. There's one more thing. Here we say the average treatment effect of the treated is not equal to the ATE. This is a small technicality. We can make it equal to the ATE if we can, um, well, if we say that the group that uh, after treatment, there's also no difference. So this is a small technicality. I won't go into the, de the, the derivation of this, but it basically says the treated and untreated group only differ on the treatment itself. So before the treatment and after the treatment, there's no difference in how the groups would have behaved. So when does this happen? How can we make the treated and untreated group only be different from the treatment itself? Well, that's, um, I think, the solution. Then we can qu really quickly skip to the next part. And I know someone who's reading the book right now. So it's basically A-B testing. So randomized control trials. If you can assign stuff, then the, the group before treatment and after treatment is only different in terms of the treatment. So that's why in A-B testing and randomized control trials, you have to really make sure that your, both your groups are very similar. So do, you, do an AA test first. Check if those groups are actually being divided in the right way. But I think there's a small problem because not everything can be done with randomized control trials, or at least you can try. I, I still don't really believe that this was an actual experiment. But um, <laughs> I'll just leave that there. So what sometimes happens is we have only observational data. So we have only have data that we can see. We can't actually put people in different groups because it's either not ethical or it's just practically infeasible. Same thing with pricing problems are quite often like that. You can't give two people different prices on the same website or in the same store. And then there's a, a, another couple of things. So the, the most important one is when training classic machine learning models, you have a trained test split. It's very easy to measure how well you're doing and what you're predicting and what you would have predicted. But now we're trying to measure and think of and calculate a quantity that is unmeasurable. So how do you evaluate if you're doing it right? Well, on the one hand, that's really nice for the person calculating it because you can be very confident, but it's really hard to convince your business that you're doing the right thing. There's a whole bunch of, uh, a whole bunch of literature currently going on in that. So let's quickly um, work through an, a practical example. So does 
do tea drinkers live longer? So does the fact that you drink tea make you live longer? Well, if we grab the data, it doesn't seem that, ca that way. So people don't, that don't drink tea, people that drink tea, and the probability of death. It seems that if you drink tea, it's not really kind of helping out. Of course, I, I simulated this data, but what, so the, the average treatment effect, or if you start drinking tea, there's a 34% higher probability of you dying. Something seems to be wrong. Um, what could be wrong? Well, who is drinking tea generally? Well, it's quite often people that are a bit older. So what we then start saying is drinking tea, <laughs> <laughs> says the gray man. Um, the, so, so the people that actually um, drink tea, and you're kind of interested in this causal arrow. So how does drinking tea impact your probability of death? Well, what we now are seeing is that people that are a bit older drink, tea, drink maybe drink more tea, and people that are older might die a bit faster. So maybe those two things are correlated. So they're kind of a common effect of both variables. It's called a confounder. Um, so what you see here is the probability of death given the age. So if you start getting older, your probability of death goes up. Well, we all know that that's the case. And the probability of drinking tea becomes higher as you age as well. That's, that's just something that uh, I've assumed. So what can you do to kind of solve for this problem? Well, this is how the data was generated, by the way. So what you see here is we've got your age. And then you see, for the people drinking tea or not drinking tea, the probability of death. So you see drinking tea is slightly reducing your probability of death at the same age. So that's what we now know. Uh, it's something that we would never know normally. But how could we kind of figure this out? Well, if we have this, this kind of this graph of what, what is happening, or DAG, everything is a DAG nowadays, um, then we get back the fundamental problem of, of causal inference. This is something that will always be the case. So what we're looking for is how can we reduce this bias? Because this bias term is basically what we're saying right now, is that how does the treated group uh, is different from the untreated group before treatment? So the treated group is the old people generally, because they have uh, kind of drink more tea, and the untreated group drinks less tea. So that's how they are different. So how can we remove this difference? Just do a group by on age. So it basically just means we, we condition on or we block the confounder or whatever kind of fancy econometric term you want to use for it. It just means we're going to group it by or we're going to involve it in the, in the modeling. So what then happens is if we normalize age, so everyone can be the same age, or you just say everyone at random ages should drink tea, such that we can have a randomized control trial, what we start seeing is that actually there is an increase, indeed a decreased effect of dying when you're age. How do you technically implement this? Import the linear regression here. Only see if T explains death. It doesn't, then we in, in involve uh, age in it. So it, can we go through this entire lengthy process of talking about it, basically as, add a variable to your regressor, and then you're there. It's not that special. And then we can also do it in PyMC, and then you can get a, like a fancy little graph of, of distributions, how certain you are. But it's all not that, that fancy. So OK, but how does this kind of compute to more complex problem. Marketing mixed models are basically models that, is, is anyone very familiar with them? None really. So it's basically a model that says, how well does my ad spend increase my uh, sales? That, that's basically what you're trying to estimate and every marketing person is interested in this. Well, there's a lot of research going on. Um, even Google research this year came out with kind of basically the model I'm now showing. It's very interesting. I will go through it pretty quickly. So. What we're spending on Google Ads, how does that increase sales? What we're spending on Instagram Ads, how is that increasing sales? There's a seasonality pattern to sales. There's a trend to sales. So our company is doing well, we're going up. Uh, but there's a confounder there. And that's basically the old people drinking tea. That, that's basically what you should uh, think about. Um, so yeah, there's some technicalities of how marketing mix models work. So if you spend every extra euro you spend in marketing, um, you, you get a bit less. So it's a saturation, right? If you spend two euros, it isn't that you will sell two euros, uh, twice as much as when you spend one euro. So there, there's a kind of a, um, a decreasing amount. Uh, what is it? Uh, yeah, diminishing returns. Second thing you, you have is ad stock. Ad stock is basically a delayed effect. So if, if I spend a whole bunch of money right now, it isn't the case that you will buy it tomorrow. You have to kind of get it, uh, see it repeatedly. You see it on the highway. You see it on your Instagram. Then maybe in a week's time, you actually buy something. So these two things you kind of should apply on your spend. 
If you apply those two things on your spend on your marketing channel, so put them in a function, reach an ad stock, then you can get to some uh, way of estimating sales. So here we have a data process that we put all that together. So we, we generated ourselves a whole bunch of things. So we've got a trend, then we've got seasonality in there. That's the yellow thing. And then what we spend on, on, on everything. So this is just a decomposition of this one. Very, other than that, not massively uh, interesting. This is our actual spend pattern. So this is uh, build up. This is just a spend pattern over the course of uh, two, three years. And then how our sales is progressing over that time. So it doesn't really necessarily seem as if our marketing is adding an insane amount. We apply those uh, ad stock and then kind of the, that transformation. It's very interesting. By the way, this is, if you really want to go in depth on this, please read the blog of uh, Juan Arduz. I will share the slides later, but um, this is the model that you make. Way too complex, super um, high level, um, but then you start estimating it. So it's a Bayesian model that you can build up, then you start build, making um, uncertainties. You do a check with Bayesian modeling afterwards to kind of see, and this is, uh, this is a bit uh, interesting. So you start estimating sales, and you basically start seeing how well is my model explaining the sales. So this is basically your fit predict. So your R squared value, you just start saying, how well uh, is my posterior distribution being explained by the data uh, or the other way around. Um, and then we can start saying, hey, we've got our uncertainty. So we have estimated this effect. And when we include that confounder, we see that the channel contribution, so how much money is uh, Google Ads contributing? Well, the, the line in the middle is the st stuff that we actually, uh, the data generation process, and then the, the blue bar around it is our estimate. So it is, it's actually tracking quite well. So that's nice. So we've included everything that's completely fine. I know there's some response curves, but it's not super interesting. So here we now, let's say this confounder is something that Google changed something in the algorithm. That's why our Google ads are not working that well. But people can also cannot find our website anymore that well. Well, we don't know that. We can't measure how Google has changed its algorithm. It happens all the time. So now we have our confounder, so our old man drinking tea that we can't measure. So we don't know that there's old people in that sense. So what happens is that, well, not interesting. There's a part of the model that we can't add into the model because we just simply can't measure it. So what does this mean? Well, our model still fits pretty well. But now we have our effect that's kind of almost way below or way overestimating our effects of Google Ads. And this is kind of the thing that if we start adding all our variables in there, perfect. So we try to add as much as possible because we want to prevent this effect. That's kind of the conclusion here. I'm uh, happy to go into the marketing mix models if, if someone is interested afterwards of, of how these uh, come together. But here now I can see a real world example of how lack of adding a confounder um, is making your model less accurate. It could still be that you can predict quite well what my sales will be, but you can't predict what the impact is of marketing on that sales process. So our conclusion here is basically if you have any confounders or any variables that you think of, let's just add them in the model because it will prevent any confounders from happening. So that's really nice. So yeah, and don't be scared of hidden confounders, just start modeling, just don't worry too much about these DAGs and putting them together perfectly. Um, but then what we see here is Include all variables to avoid confounders. And then there's <laughs> something else that can pop up. So let's, let's quickly look at that. We go back to our first example. I'm quickly checking the time. Is everyone still fresh enough? <laughs> still tracking? That's good. So we go back. If we apply treatment now, we, we are interested in that fungicide and the plant example again. So we say we apply treatment. Do we have fungus, yes or no? So the treatment will impact if we have fungus. So quite often if you apply fungicide, the plant will uh, not have fungus. There might also be a direct effect of applying fungicide on the growth of the plant. It could be positive, it could be negative, but maybe the fungicide is doing something with your plant as well. And then the fungus does something with the plant, and then also today it's a bit taller than yesterday, so there's a time effect in there. Still, now, now we have kind of a different type of um, thing that pops up. Still we have a bias. So um, I won't completely explain what, what's going on there, but what you now start saying is like, what would happen? We were just saying we should apply, add all the variables in, in our model because it helps the, the, the explainability. But what would happen here? If we add all the variables in our model, it means that we add fungus as an explanatory variable or we group by fungus basically. So we start saying we have fungus and we have no fungus groups. And 
how well can we predict and it's not the height of the plant because that's what we would predict if it were a data science problem but now we are saying the treatment effect so we are interested in this little line over here so what is the impact of um, treatment on the plant so we now start let's say you want to find the red from the blue circles here and you want to find the red from the blue circles here it's nearly impossible to do so if you now start saying hey let's say I just split by control and by treatment then suddenly you start seeing hey I see everything red down here everything blue up there well that's that's uh, fungus and no fungus that's fine but now you start seeing there's actually a bit of a pattern where as soon as I do apply treatment it seems like I have more no fungus and it seems that the plants are kind of slightly bigger again going back if we look here we have no fungus and we do have do, do have fungus then the growth of the plant we can predict quite well because if we know that the plant has no fungus it's most likely going to be a bit taller than when it, ha it does have fungus but we're not interested in predicting that we're inter interested in what is our treatment doing to this plant so here we basically say if we let me see i think I should, yeah i should have it so if we take the uh, kind of the treatment effect into or the the, the fungicide in included in the model then we get a biased model and we basically say hey applying fungicide decreases the growth of the plant by about 0.05 whereas what the correct answer would have been should have been is it, it actually increases the growth of the plant so what basically i'm saying here is that by conditioning including this in your in your model or grouping by fungus first grouping by the fungus and then estimating the growth of the plant or the, the treatment effect you're basically deteriorating your treatment effect and in introducing bias so yeah no that's it <laughs> what happened is you're asking the wrong question. So here we're looking at a plant that needs fungicide. But if you are applying fungicide on a plant that does not need it, so you're now you're adding to your model, or the, the question you're asking, what you're trying to measure, is something that does not really have any... Uh, useful... Yeah, any, yeah, usefulness or any effect. Like in, in cells, if you start, I don't know, cells are bombarding us with uh, something that we don't need, it doesn't really affect us to a certain extent. So what happens if you ask the wrong question, basically? Yeah, that's you, a you need to really focus on what you want to know in the question, and is the question relevant to what you... That's, that's a very good point. So that, that's an entire thing quite often with... First, you have your data, and quite often from the moment you have your data, you start thinking, okay, I want to build a model. Instead of thinking what you're saying is, what is the, the, the data process that I would need to answer the question that I actually have? But then the step before that is again, what is the question that I actually need to answer? So in machine learning, if you had, it's known that if you add all the data, you're going to yeah, either produce garbage, either overfit somewhere. I, there is always something. I think in machine learning, the regular field, let's say, uh, what people were saying that the pure statistics there, they always say, no, you have to make sure that you use exactly the variables that you think are relevant. And then based on that, you have yeah. So the reason for, 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 for that part is mainly that what, what I'm saying now is like if you keep adding all the variables, like if I, if I add all the variables right now, so if I add fungus, my prediction will be better of the height of the plant. So I, I will be way more knowledgeable if, of predicting how big is my plant going to be. But your, um, the meaning of your uh, coefficient, that coefficients doesn't mean anything anymore because of the biases that are now in the data. So it, it also very much depends on what do you want to know do i need to predict the height of the plant tomorrow well then i just throw everything in there same thing with uh, basically your llms right uh, and your stable diffusion they're just trying to reproduce what they have seen before and it is working and it's valuable so it, for the use case they have their their kind of model is fine but in case you're indeed doing more statistics work which is in the marketing department in the sales department in the pricing department because if you take an action based on the output, it quite often comes from what if we would have done this differently? And the, the question should be very well defined before you start working on anything. Uh, and that's also the, the point. Like Fungus is a better predictor for growth than treatment. But in case you want to know what the impact of your treatment is, you have to ask a different question. And then you think, yeah, but this is silly, right? Why would you group by on fungus, yes or no, and then start predicting so why why would you ever do this in, in kind of in real life well it actually happens more often than you think and it's because it's a lot more subtle when this happens in real life these these grouping by of post treatment variables so let's say i'm going to personalize someone's marketing so i'm going to say i'm going to send that person marketing and that person marketing because of i want to prevent churn or i want to increase clv in this case 
So your personalized marketing might have a really good deal for a product. So you send them an email, uh, you say 30% off or this, this amazing product, they buy it straight away so their CLV goes up. But if you have this personalized marketing, it will also just maybe drive engagement. Maybe the, the, the text of the wording is, is kind of really interesting and that's what a marketing department is aiming to do, right? They're trying to keep the person engaged. And engagement eventually will also drive, so that the, the, those are views, will ev eventually drive CLV. Because if you're engaged for longer, eventually you will buy more in the long run. So basically, if you start saying, and it's not that weird if you say, I personalize marketing, I just throw how many views I've had in the model to kind of predict what my CLV is going to be. Now you've got a bias where you're most likely underestimating your, the impact of your personalized marketing. And this is a very kind of subtle effect of adding one simple variable in there, which will significantly bias your model. And then, yeah, there's, a, there's another one, uh, kind of a very classic one, which is the, the, the potential to buy from marketing. So what you start seeing is quite often you have a customer spend from one moment to the next is they don't buy anything, right? Like if you look at the transactional data set, most people are not buying versus buying. So um, let's quickly check the time. <laughs> I think it, it, I, w I will skip this for a bit. Like it's a very technical one again. So it, it very much says that if you have data that basically has a lot of nulls in it, what quite often you do as a data scientist is you start first predicting, am I expecting a sale, yes or no? And then after that, I start predicting, ah, if I have sales, then this is going to be my amount of sales. But if you actually do that, it's the exact same thing as including a post-treatment variable. Because if you do that, then let's quickly say that the person that actually did not buy anything, a specific person, is now out of your data set. So you're implicitly already saying, um, oh, I'm already uh, put it away. You're implicitly already saying like, I don't consider for my AOV the people that did not buy anything. So the treatment itself, they disappear from your data and thereby by missing them, you have also kind of have a certain level of um, post-treatment bias. It, it, I'm happy to dive way more in detail. Yeah? Why would you ever condition on a post-treatment That's a very good question. You shouldn't. <laughs> but conditioning on it um, happens quite often by just including it in a model that tries to predict something and then you kind of s start seeing. No, I would, I would definitely say so, but th that's the, the basic, basic thing of... Uh, um, and there, there sometimes there's like these post-treatment variables and selection biases happen in really annoying ways where if you more technical, if your DAG is too long um, and there's like an odd connection there, then you have to kind of really uh, go through your DAG to make sure that any conditioning that you do doesn't down the line uh, kind of waterfall into a post-treatment bias. Um, I think I will wrap it up by now because I still have an entire example of going through CLV modeling, but uh, I think I will skip that. Is there, or is anyone still very much interested in uh, going very deep diving into our Gamma distributions and exponential distributions. No. <laughs> Basically, use PyMC marketing. They make it super easy. Um, so th th this is kind of the next uh, uh, the next step that I wanted to say is just use use this. You can make it all yourself, but please don't because all these plots are uh, predetermined. So the, the expectation that someone is still alive, the propensity of them to buy, the amount of uh, expected sales they might have, because your sales data is normally very much uh, the same in terms of the way it's structured. That's about it. So uh, there's, there's a whole bunch of uh, extra stuff you can read. I really, really enjoy it. Kind of the, the uh, guy, Matthijs Fakur, he's got, he's got a great blog for free. So the causal inference for the brave and the true, which I really would recommend if you want to understand anything about causal inference from a kind of a, um, an intuitive sense. I hope this has kind of piqued your interest in the field and how you might be able to apply it in what, what part of the company. And if there's any questions, then please uh, let me know.
if the data feature is not important, it will ignore it. And you will have a model that knows the posterior, understand the data distribution. So, so in your experience, like, how, what is the edge of causal model over the Bayesian ML model? So the the uh, there's uh, two two small things. So the the posterior distribution from a softmax is uh, that that really goes into technical details is not ne necessarily a, a right posterior because you're doing ma maximum likelihood estimation. So you're maximizing the likelihood probability, just the probability of um, predicting the data given the variables or the, the parameters how you're setting them. So you're basically trying to maximize the probability that you ex can explain the data from the way you've set, yeah. let's say, your, your variables. What you're trying to do with, with uh, Bayesian inference, you try to turn it around, which is kind of weird. So you say, what is the probability that I get these parameters given the data generation process I have? So it's, it's looking at the data in a different way. So the, there's uncertainties on your parameters now instead of the other way around. And this is like the infinite discussion that you can have with uh, p-values and um, confidence intervals versus posterior distributions, but both of them have their own place. I completely agree there. Yeah. The so, okay. yeah. so in application domain, do you see like this causal inference model doing better than those models? Or? No, so they, they have a different use case. So what, 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 what uh, the, let's say you want to predict something with all your, just have, have a future prediction of something, then just use classic ML, it, it works perfectly. But if you want to start saying, what is the impact of a variable on a different variable causally, so what, how does this causally impact so an output, then you have to start tearing it apart. And then the meaning, because of all these biases and confounders and all that shit, it basically um, starts saying that the meaning of your coefficients doesn't really apply anywhere. Your SHEP values are also just linearizations about around your output. So SHEP values and uh, just your, uh, what, what is it? Uh, just coefficients of your linear regression don't mean anything anymore in terms of causal uh, explanation. It's a bit of a, a technical side note. I don't know if it makes sense, but uh, yeah. good enough. Yes. Yeah. So I, w what I would say is, first of you can always make a DAG more complex. Uh, and whenever you start modeling something, please start as easy as possible. Um, and you will miss things. And there's unobservable confounders. And there's like confounders that, that actually impact too many variables that you can't really control for them because then a different bias occurs. What I would say is, first, just have a first approach. Let's say you uh, just combine two things. Then go to stakeholders and then start discussing, does this make sense? And how would the priors look? How would the entire kind of structure look? And then start refining it from there because there's always something else that you can take into account because we've always heard it, right? The same thing with ML. Have you considered weather data? It's always a, kind of an input somewhere. I would say just start simple and have an iterative process with the end user always who's actually going to take actions based on your model. <coughs> yeah. yeah, and that's a really annoying thing because you can't have a... Uh, a trained test split and, a, and an R squared or an, an MSE or anything like that, it becomes a very difficult way to convince a stakeholder. So it's better to get them on board in the way you've modeled your process. And if it makes sense to him, then, and that's in the end, like how science has been done with statistics for ages, yeah. Very low level question. How much, like, uh, is it greedier in terms of data? Does it need more? Because you're, you're looking way wider than just your regular inference, I guess. Yeah. So the, the less data you have, the bigger your variance will be. And that's why, I like with causal inference, if you're still using point estimates with a really small amount of data, then you're still very certain. You seem to be very certain because you have a point estimate. But the, exactly, and that's why that statistical rethinking book is really nice. Also, if anyone, like the statistical rethinking book and course by uh, this guy, it's not mathematical at all. He's go, he goes around it very intuitively. So I would really... Really go for it. Uh, he updates it every time, and the last couple updates has been a lot of uh, causal inference. But coming back to your question, uh, you don't need a lot, but your posterior distribution will be very wide. So you will be very uncertain about what you're, what you're doing, and the more data you have, the, the narrower it becomes.
that's basically it.